All right, good, good, good. Let's get some pictures of these celebrities. Come on, let's go. Camera one. Yes, yes, very nice. Let's get somebody younger. Let's try camera two. Who we got on camera? Ah, Duncan Goodyear. He looks like he's a little wet. He must have been swimming just before he came here. Get a towel and dry him off. He looks terrible on the show. All right, who we got? Three. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, three is, who's that? Bob, Bob uh, Geldorf? Boomtown Rats, Bob Geldorf, yes, yes. Uh, take him out and get him shaved, and then bring him back in. All right, camera four, let's have a get... Ah, yes. Oh, there's an interesting girl, yes. I must talk to her later. Uh, all right, let's have camera three. Camera three, what have we got on camera three? Punch up camera three for me. What have we got? Good, 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 no good. Camera two, what have we got on two now? Let's go back to two again. Oh, there is Derek. Derek Nemo, wonderful. He used to be Captain Nemo, but he was demoted to a Derek. He's doing very well. And let's see. Oh, we're getting close to showtime, folks. So let us cue Mel Brooks. Get Mel Brooks out there. Where the hell is Mel Brooks? That's you. Oh, my God, that's me. I bet... Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mel Brooks. Tape cost money. <laughs> you a fool out of me. I don't know how to thank you for coming here. So no thanks. <laughs> Ladies and Jews, when I was a child, <laughs> this <sighs> this show. This show is a partnership. Very much like like a marriage. It, it, it's, it's teamwork. And like a marriage, I'm sure, it's going to fall apart. I know. <laughs> I, mean, I feel it. I know it. <laughs> but it depends as much on you people. It depends as much on the audience as it is on the performer up here. Now, a lot of you in the audience are terrific performers yourselves. You understand this. A lot of you think you're performers. You stink. But I... I <laughs> Listen, I'm going to point out. I'm not going to make trouble here tonight. <laughs> but anyway, it's, this is a, a, an ad lib, silly, spontaneous show. And because it is that, I am going to get crazy questions from anybody who wants to ask questions. And I want this to be silly and foolish and relaxed and ad lib. And so, not to make any mistakes, I want the first question. <laughs> I want the first question, the first question, to be exactly this. <laughs> Dear Mr. Brooks, because you are a talented and powerful tap dancer, <laughs> and you can have your way with anything, men, women, in-betweens, whatever you want, <laughs> what, whom, sexually, what do you really prefer, men or women? <laughs> now, uh, Patrick, Patrick Mower is here. Patrick, would you answer that, ask me that question? Ask you that question? Yes, please ask me. Uh, here, Mr. Brooks, as a powerful and talented tap dancer, uh, <laughs> uh, and you're extremely sexual, uh, what do you prefer, uh, men or women? Well, it's none of your bloody business, Patrick. <laughs> You've got some big mouth, TV tough guy. I... I've seen him in the back of a car with a basket of fruit. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Over mine. Thank you, Patrick. Just kidding. He can give you. Uh, yeah. Derek. Uh, at the best. Stand up, Derek. Yeah. Oh, stand up, right. Derek, sit down, Derek. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you were taller. I'm sorry. No. I, make a, I make a joke. You're fucked. You want to scare So stand up. Stand that, up in your white suit, up. you right. fool. Well, well, I would you... really like to ask you, Mr. Brooks, were you a very precocious child? Right. <laughs> I am the baby boy of four sons. My mother had four sons. My father died when he was two. It had nothing to do with me, believe me. <laughs> One night, my mother, my mother, a little Jewish woman, Kitty, she's about this big. Everybody has to talk now. <laughs> 
I don't even know if this can be on the show, but this is a true story, I swear to God. She's sitting on a stoop with, uh, with a little handkerchief, you know, under her tush. <laughs> so nice other Jewish ladies on the stoop in Brooklyn. Everybody sat on the stoop in the summertime. It was too hot to go in and sleep. And uh, my brother Brady was in the bathroom, and I couldn't get in, and I was trying to get in, and boy, did I have to go. I really had to go, I swear. <laughs> and I couldn't, and the sink, I was too little to, for the sink. I would, you know, I would run the water, but I couldn't get up to the sink. And I had to go. So, the, the window was open. The window was open. I didn't want to look. I didn't want to know. And I, I swear, I peed out the window. I had to go. And unbeknownst to me, my mother was sitting down on the stoop with her friends, <laughs> with Jenny and Dottie and Katie and Sylvia, and, and they said, Kitty, is it raining? What's go? What's the... It... Hey, it's coming from your window! And, uh, it was terrible. My mother started going. My mother was like a little rhinoceros. She's running. I heard these steps. I said, uh-oh, this is terrible. I, I think I hit my mother with the rest of the lady. I jumped into bed. I pulled the cover over myself. I may believe I was asleep. My mother... Door burst open, she came in. Bernie just walks out of the toilet. Springtime, boy. <laughs> Bang! She just <doesn't... laughs> she beat the hell out of him. To this day, Bernie doesn't know. If he ever watches this show, he'll know what happened. <laughs> but it's a true story. Now, Donald, would you please stand up? Thank you. Donald, I've been a very, very small fan of yours for years. <laughs> I swear to God. I mean, you have never been a great favorite of mine, but I've always respected you. <laughs> if I were forced to, I would work with you, I swear. <laughs> or just taking the Michael out of you. Please. I right, was going to ask you. Me. Yes. I was going to ask you, Miss Brooks. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you've ever done anything that you were thoroughly ashamed of. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Donald. Well, apart from Sheila in Cincinnati, let's see. Oh, yeah. When I was a little kid, I was uh, nearly arrested. This is another true story. I was in the Woolworths with my friend Moish, and we never had money, so we would st always steal something, like a little yo-yo or, or a toy of some kind. This day, I stole a little tiny toy pistol, a toy gun. And I nearly got away with it. I was walking out the store, and I said, Hey, you! No, it wasn't near you. It was in America. <laughs> <laughs> it was, hey, you, hey, you kid, come back here. I saw you take that toy gun. I didn't know what to do. I was petrified, I swear to God. So I pulled out this little toy gun and said, stand back, I'll blow your head off. <laughs> and he did. He stood back and we ran out of the store. Right? It was wonderful. It's a true story. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Julie. Yes. Julie, uh, do you have a question that pertains to this show in any way? Yeah, I think so. Oh, you're, very good. Right. You're not going to make a fool of me, though, are you? No, no, Julie. I don't. I never, make f I never make a fool of women. Never. You never know when you need them. <laughs> oh, how marvelous. Well, I just want to ask Did you have a difficult puberty? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, I'll go back to the days when I was a pubert. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. What, what were you saying? Here? I was going to say. Have you been through it yet? Oh, puberty. <laughs> Wait. Yes. You show us, yes. Mate. Yes. I've been through it. I've been through it and unfortunately over it. <laughs> All right. Um, is Gordon Jackson in the audience or isn't he? Sir. Gordon, I yes. Sir. Is it true that you were a war hero? False. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you about my war experiences. After they found me in Canada, <laughs> I immediately enlisted, not to serve Tom. And uh, I spent uh, some time in the army, and I rose to the rank of corporal. Yes. Don't sneer, you little lieutenants and right tenants out there. <laughs> corporal ain't bad. Hitler was a corporal. Napoleon was a corporal. I, short guys, maybe they make corporals. What do you want from me? <laughs> I became a corporal. And um, uh, one day, I was leading my men uh, back toward where we lived. <laughs> 
And uh, we, we, we stumbled upon a uh, case of German Mauser rifles. Everything I tell you here is true. I may embroider it, but it's all true. <laughs> Sharp shooting rifles. And uh, we opened the case, wiped the grease off. There was ammunition. There was white ceramic insulators all over this telephone pole. And we all bet a couple of bucks. The one who could knock off with these things won the pool of money. So we all shot at it, and some tall Gentile from Arkansas won. <laughs> Tuesday, all we know is that the gun goes, when you pull the trigger, that thing hits you in the shoulder. And uh, then when uh, we knocked off all the insulators, we blew, blew them to hell. And then we got back in our command car. We drove back to, to headquarters, and they were up in arms. We were all running around. What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? The Germans have cut off communication between the 7th Army and, and our unit. <laughs> How? What? Well, uh, they, they broke the telephone wires. I said, oh, my God. They said, and we need a, we need a unit. The, the Germans must be in the area. And I said, I'm volunteering. <laughs> they are my men to go out there and find those crowds and, if necessary, kill them and stop this loss of communication. And that's, I want a bronze star for that. <laughs> for going out and doing that. They gave me a thing. That's the American Army. That's a true story. Thank you. In 1952, there was a review on Broadway. See, we're doing this chronologically. Stole a toy gun when I was 10. Entered the army, found in Canada when I was 18, right? Here we are in 1952 when I'm 11. In 1952, there was a wonderful show on Broadway, a wonderful review. It was called New Faces of 1952. And it starred, among other creatures, Eartha Kitt, Robert Clary, Carol Lawrence, June Carroll, Paul Lind, and last and least, <laughs> one of the people I've fallen madly in love and been in love with for a very long time, since 1952, when we both worked on New Faces of 52, a very dear friend of mine. His name is Ronnie Graham. <laughs> Ronnie is most talented and a terrific guy. When, in 52, I first met him, he had dark hair, or rather, he, was, he looked like a handsome gargoyle. He was beautiful. <laughs> and it's a pity to see that time has taken him into an alley and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But anyway, he's hard to look at today. <laughs> and, and we'd like, with your permission, we'd like, on this stage tonight, we would like to do... Uh, Ronnie, get to the piano. We'd like to do retreat for you, okay? That's it. Ronnie's a wonderful guy. I don't care what they say. <laughs> All right, I'll stand next to you because uh, it's been a long time and our eyes are gone as well as our minds. <laughs> Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a nice accordion. Oh, happy birthday. Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. is a man who invented a disease where you forget everything. <laughs> and I think we both got it. What was All the right. name of the disease again? Alzheimer's. <laughs> I think okay. I forgot. All right. right. Here we go. Now, uh, ladies and germs, pay attention. Um, we'll take it from an officer of France. Right. Uh, um, watch this. An officer of France am I. My rank is general. And if you ask me how I feel, I'll tell you I feel mal. Mal de tet? Nah. Mal de mer? No. Mal de what? Mal de guerre. <laughs> I'm sick of war for many reasons. Three of them will do. It's 1815. I am French, and this is Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> to arms, soldiers of France. Lift up your lance, pick up your pants, the battle's begun. <laughs> to arms, heroes of gold. This is no stall, get on the ball, the battle's begun. The enemy's advancing with murder in his eye. Our way, I think he's glancing. For us, it's do or die. I don't mind the do part. <laughs> but die? Why? Listen, folks, I have a very good idea. Treat, treat. Got the soul to run. The foe is near, our choice is clear. Get out of here, hooray for fear, we're done. Run away, 
run away. If you run away, you live to run away another day. Retreat, retreat, give your feet a chance. I've got good news for all of you, so you gotta lose some of your shoes. Don't friends, face defeat, be discreet, and retreat. retreat. Show me a man with deep red blood in his veins. If he got brains, he'll keep that blood in his veins. <laughs> Show me a man who doesn't know the meaning of fear. Show me a horse, and I'll disappear. <laughs> Show me a man who loves the smell of a fight. Right. Show me a man who scorns the coward in flight. Show me a man who loves the feel of steel in his gut. Show me that man, I'll show you a nut. <laughs> What am I saying? What am I talking? What am I doing? How can I talk like this? How can I forget my love <laughs> France? Ah, ah. Both my eyes get wet for love. <laughs> Children playing hide and seek besides a little same. Children, dentists pulling out French teeth with very little pain. Oh. All right, enough. <laughs> Every night I dream of love, France. Take my loss and team, but don't take France. I would, for her glory, I would die. <laughs> I would cheat and rob and spy, but I'll be damned if I'm gonna die <laughs> for love, friend. Here they come, they're breaking through. What do we do? What do we do? <laughs> retreat, retreat. Give your feet a chance. I got big news for all of you. We gotta lose some moves. Just for friends, face defeat. Be in the street. This is it. Time to greet, backward feet, and This begins the second part of Spontaneity <laughs> avec Monsieur Melbrook. I don't know. Two restaurants I go in, I can't get my, can't get my name. I can never get my own name. Chinese restaurant, ah, oh, Mr. Melbrook. Mr. Melbrook. <laughs> one, one, one name, Melbrook. Melbrook. French, ah, oh, Monsieur Melbrook. Ah, Melbrook. Venez ici, Monsieur Melbrook. No, nous avons un table pour vous tout le temps, oh, Monsieur. Melbrook, Melbrook. If I call up and say, uh, this is Mr. Brooks, I'd like a reservation. No. If I say, Melbrook, he see, ah, come in. <laughs> Melbrook. So I may change my name to Irving Melbrook. <laughs> um, I, I come here very often. I love England. Uh, the, the differences in our culture, though, are, are really sensational. I mean, apart from the gulf of language, we do have sensational differences in, in, our, in our cultures. Um, English television, English commercials. Mummy, mummy, may I have a bad curry? May I have some bad curry's chocolates? Of course, dear, have as many as you want. Don't forget, Daddy is a dentist. <laughs> in America, in America, their problems are lower down. It's not here, it's a little down here. To... Get dynamite! <laughs> Blast your problems free! <laughs> And the English, the, the, news, the, the newscast is here. I don't, know how, I don't know how you know what's going on in the world. <laughs> <laughs> in the North Country, the isobars tell us, isobar, is it raining or ain't it raining? <laughs> what's with the isobar? The 20 degree, but uh, you don't even get your degrees right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, yesterday, in the Gulf of Aqaba, an Iranian tanker, almost collided with a Kuwaiti vessel. <laughs> Fortunately, they missed each other and no one was injured. <laughs> it's English news, that's the English news. <laughs> in America, the same, the same broadcast in America. Two wacky Arab ships nearly hit head on. <laughs> on 
Unfortunately, nobody was hurt. <laughs> I know. That's a bit. But England has given us everything. England has given us our letters. We got M from England. <laughs> Beautiful letter. L, gorgeous letter. A is a beautiful letter, too. We didn't care for V and D. We got those letters. <laughs> the letters came. But the crowning jewel of, of English culture is, is, let's face it, is William Shakespeare, the bard himself. He is probably the greatest, most thrilling human writer that ever lived. I will ever be grateful for England giving us William Cohen Shakespeare. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? you? Didn't know his middle name was Cohen, did you? Well, I did that everything. Got to pay attention. I don't mean his work. I mean his penmanship. It was perfect. <laughs> no, he, was, he was the best. Shakespeare was the best. In my, uh, in my uh, picture, in my movie, I'm proud to announce that I actually do Hamlet's soliloquy. Mr. Brooks. Yes, who are you, please? My name is Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren, how are you? Helen Mirren's here, folks. <laughs> Let's hear it for Helen. Thank you. Helen. <laughs> Helen's an actress of the Royal Shakespeare Company, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sure she's going to appreciate my work in the picture as Hamlet. I mean, let's face well, it. Well, that's, I was just wondering what sort of qualifications you thought you had for playing a part of Hamlet. What do you mean, qualifications? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking well, qualifications? You don't think been... Americans can play Shakespeare? No. You don't think we should do it? We can do Hamlet, do you, Helen Merrill? We have Merrill, to be very serious to play Hamlet. <laughs> what about Edwin Booth? What about Edwin Booth's Hamlet, eh? John Barrymore's Hamlet. Mickey Rooney's Hamlet. <laughs> yes. Plenty of big Hamlets in America, lady. Well, Mr. Brooks and has I'm some great Hamlets least... sitting yeah. here in this audience tonight. Some of you the do. great Hamlets of the uh, English stage. You got a Hamlet here tonight? I've got a few Hamlets here tonight well, for I'll... you. <laughs> All right, Helen. All right, Helen. <laughs> I'll wager a fiver that, putting it on the outside. <laughs> I'll wager a fiver that I can, whoever you got here, that my Hamlet, I have a film clip here of me doing Hamlet, that my Hamlet is better. We'll let the audience judge. They're English people. They have naturally they're going to side with the English, but my Hamlet is so terrific. I'll bet on them. I'll bet on them betting on me. You can't do Hamlet. it live. Who have you got here? Well, I've got Alan Howard, one of the greatest Hamlets we've ever seen. I've also got Jonathan Price here, another great Hamlet. Take your pick. I've got... Uh, what about Bernie Winters trying? I've got Bernie Winters. <laughs> All right, you're on for five pounds. Pick, pick one of them. I'll take the bet, and I'll take Jonathan. All right. Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> How are you, Jonathan? All right, Jonathan, I will make it very simple. First of all, where did you get your sandals? <laughs> oh, never mind. I know, I know. I know you have a tonsure in sandals because you're playing Martin Luther for the BBC. That's right. We were, we're wagering five pounds. You will do a little bit, not so feel, not too much, of <laughs> Hamlet's famous soliloquy, Wherefore Art Thou? And, <laughs> and I will... No, I know, I, I know. I even know it in French. Etre ne pas être. I know it in everywhere. But... We're going to do to be or not to be. You're going to do a little soliloquy, and the audience will judge who does the superior Hamlet. <clears throat> Jonathan. <clears throat> Go ahead. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing it, end them. To die. To sleep. No more. No more. I... <laughs> That's, That's... 
Not half bad, not half. <laughs> not half bad. Where the hell didn't Bernie Winters try it? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna hold my hand over Jonathan's head, I'm gonna hold my hand over my own head, and we'll see which Hamlet you prefer. First, Jonathan Price. It's enough. We got it. We understand. We got it. Here, give her the five pounds. <laughs> take, a, take, a, take a pound for yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> Jonathan Price. You're very good, Jonathan. I don't care what they say. <laughs> All right. Now, listen, folks. In the audience is a Jewish comedian. He is funnier than anybody that has ever lived. He's had a hard time proving it. <laughs> Tonight on this stage, I'd like to bring to your attention the questions of Bernie Winters. Bernie, where are you? Uh, what can I say to one Jewish boy to another? It's so lovely. Well, talk, uh... talk in Yiddish. I'll understand. <laughs> it's been a long time since my bar mitzvah. Right. Well, what I would like to ask you, uh, and before I do, I just want to say thank you for having us here this evening because we're having a terrific time. Is, my pleasure. Is how did you start in show business? How did I get into show business? I could tell you many stories. I could, I could tell you lies. I could tell you truth. Uh, ever since I was that high, <laughs> <laughs> I always... I always wanted to be something. I always wanted to make noise. I became a drummer because it was the loudest instrument in the band. I actually got at the show because there was a guy in my neighborhood by the name of Don Appel. Now, he was a comedian. He started in the Borscht Belt, which is, you understand, but for those of you of some exotic persuasion, like Catholic, <laughs> the, the Borscht Belt is a place in the, the Jewish Catskills, right outside of New York City. And uh, Jews go there to... Uh, bask in the sunshine to get away from the heat of the city, to swim in swimming pools, to, and mainly eat sour cream. I think that's, <laughs> that's their main avocation there. And uh, Don Appel worked there, and he had an opening song. His song was something like, my name is Donnie, they call me funny, and I will make you laugh. It's one of those dopey songs. <laughs> I had a song. He got me a job there. I became a comic, I got a song. My song was, here I am, I'm Melvin Brooks. I've come to stop the show. <laughs> Just a ham whose minus looks, but in your hearts I'll grow. <laughs> I'll tell you guys, I'll sing you songs. I'll be little snappy tunes are roll along. I'm out of my mind, so won't you be kind and please love <laughs> Melvin Brooks. That was my opening number. From there on, believe me, it went downhill. I swear to God. <laughs> they all liked me. The Jews would sit there, these little old ladies, uh, the, 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 the critics, you know, the critics, they'd sit there and they'd go to the tea room later and they'd have sponge cake, which is the hardest thing they could eat. <laughs> and, and they'd say, Mel Melton is good, Melton is good. He stinks, but he's good. <laughs> that was the idea of me. And, Wonderful people. The, the Jews in the mountains were wonderful. Uh, I used to entertain them around the pool. I was called a pool tumbler. <laughs> After lunch, no, they, 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 they would they'd go around the pool, they'd sit there, and they would try to, you know, uh, get rid of 14 and a half pounds of sour cream, you know? <laughs> and I would, I would tell them little jokes. I'd have a derby, I'd have an alpaca coat, I'd walk around, and I'd, and for, I'd, I'd end up... Uh, by jumping off the dining board with two cardboard suitcases filled with rocks with a derby with an alpha, and I would jump in and sink to the bottom, and as I jumped, I'd say, business stinks, I don't want to live, and I'd jump. <laughs> and they'd go, ah, ha, ha. We'd take their mind off their own stupid business, right? <laughs> but we always had a Gentile lifeguard. There's the only one who could swim. Yeah. <laughs> one of these blind guys, you know? Bob. Bob, Bob was the craziest name you could say. Morty, Morris, Martin, anything with an M worked. But Bob was really exotic. Anyway, Bob would take it into his head not to save me sometimes. He wouldn't dive down. And I nearly drowned a couple times, I swear. 
An alpaca cone filled with water. Think of it, rocks. Trying to get my props up from underwater. I'd see the Jews laughing through the ripples. I'd see, I'd see, uh, a lot of Jews died in the mountains, I must tell you. Okay. A lot of Jews died in the mountains, and mostly from trying, <clears throat> mostly from trying to sing. <laughs> Dancing in the dark after eating too much sauerkraut. <laughs> it's true. C'est vrai. C'est la vérité. They would eat gallons of sour cream, vegetables, gassy stuff. They'd go on a rocking chair. They'd go on a rocking chair, and they would start to sing Dancing in the Dark. <laughs> you can't sing Dancing in the Dark unless you start very low. Even Crosby, I'll give you, this is Crosby's, Errol, pay attention. This is Crosby's rendition of Dancing in the Dark. And I'm singing it low. Dancing in the Dark. Till the tune ends, we're waltzing in the dark, and it soon ends, and we can face the music together, dancing, yes, we're dancing in the dark. That's Crosby, 1928. That's perfect. I started real well. Here's the way the Jews started after lunch. Dancing in the dark, till the tune ends, we're waltzing in the dark. You're very good, you're very smart. I mean, I swear to God, I know what's good, and you picked up, you're picking up on nuances, and you're very good. I, I was, I was going to give you a very bad mark for dress, and a medium mark for conduct. Now it's, I mean, your average now for brains has taken, you moved everything up. You are very, you are very, very good audience. Really, I'm very proud of you. I love that. All right, let me know when we're rolling, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, Johnny. This is Johnny Gold, the owner of Tramps. Uh, last night, I vomited on some very important people. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Who's that Indian woman? I'm very sorry. <laughs> Did you get it cleaned up? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it was your fault. Won't you have some Delamain? Delamain? It's, who knows? It's a brandy. Delamain. I, I thought it was like a, you know, like a, a club soda or something. <laughs> have a little Delamain. Blah! <laughs> anyway, I'm really a, a comic, a comedy writer. I started as a comedy writer. I began writing in the 50s for a wonderful comedian by the name of Sid Caesar. We had, thanks. Sid Caesar was a great comic. Still is a great comic. In history of the world, he played the caveman. Mm -mm, he was wonderful. He had a great writing staff. Uh, a lot of you may not know that the writing staff of the show of shows consisted of people like Mel Tolkien, Lucille Callan, Tony Webster, Woody Allen, Neil Simon, myself, Larry Gelbart, who created MASH. He had a sensational writing staff. Sid Caesar was powerful. We were all afraid of him. I mean, strong. Muscles. Strength. What do you sit behind a desk? Sid didn't like a joke. He'd pick up the desk and Woody and the type, everything. He'd say, punctuate his anger. I don't like that joke. <laughs> Woody would say, we're not married to it. <laughs> right, Alicia. I went to Chicago with Sid. We were driving around Chicago. This is all true, all true story. Cab driver. Little leather bow tie. Little yellow cab, cab driver. Sid cuts him off driving, cab driver gets out, curses things you've never heard, dirty language, filth, straw, tough cab driver. Comes over to Sid. Sid opens this little clipper window to look at the cab driver. And the cab driver says, you son of a bitch, you're poor and tired and tired and tough. And Sid Caesar looks at him and he looks up, this is a true story, he looks up and says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Do, rem do, do you remember being born? Do you remember your birth? Your cab driver says, what are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? And Sid reaches out and grabs his leather bow tie and his collar and starts pulling him in this little window. <laughs> says, we're going to reenact it right now. <laughs> I swear to God, I had to, I had to bite his hand. He's very, he's very strong. He's very... One night in Chicago, this is a true story. You'll read, you can read it in this book. I said, I can't stand there anymore. I want to, let's go somewhere. Let's hang out. So he said, you want to hang out? 
All right, he picked me up on the neck, he held me out the window. <laughs> 18 floors up, he said, you like hanging out? I said, we don't have to hang out. So <laughs> <laughs> on the Sid Caesar Show was a man by the name of Howie Morris. This is what he used to do mainly. That's a little guy. There was Imogene, and there was Carl Reiner, and Howie. And Howie was always funny. Howie was always complaining. He'd always come to me because I was one of the main writers, and he'd say, I didn't get a laugh. I said, Howie, all you had to say was good morning. What the what, what kind of laugh? He said, but well, everybody else got a laugh. I mean, I said, Howie, they had funny lines. All you said was good morning. He was very hard to please, but I loved him. I loved Howie Morris. I loved him. And life, life is a series of calamities with Howie Morris. I can't tell. The funniest thing that happened to Howie, his father died. Now, let me explain that. This is true. <laughs> there was his funeral. They went up to the Bronx, he and his mother, and uh, they had his father cremated, and everything was going swell. And Howie brought $200 to pay for the funeral expenses, and they said, uh, he gave him the 200 they said, I'm sorry, that'll be $340. He said, what are you talking about? It says on the thing, $200, the cremated and the whole thing. He said, no, uh, the urn, the urn, sir, the marble alabaster urn is $100. So it is uh, 300 not not 200 So he says, I, I don't... I don't want him in the urn. <laughs> I said, what would you have us do with him, sir? I don't care. Put him in a bag. Yeah, give him... <laughs> we don't put the loved one in a paper bag, sir. We give the loved one in the urn. He said, I don't want the urn. He said, well, you'll have to get your own container, sir. So he said, OK, wait right here. He ran across the street. He got a can, bought a can of Maxwell House coffee. He opened it, he spilled out the coffee. He ran back, he said, put my father in there. Go ahead. All right, said, okay. All right, sir, all right. They took the ash, they took it out of the urn, they cleaned up the urn, they put it for somebody else. They put the urn back. They took the can of Maxwell House coffee. December, cold, <laughs> driving. Howie's father's wish, last wishes. You go, last wishes. Throw my ashes in the Hudson River. Well, it's hard to do. It's hard to throw your ashes in the Hudson River because it, it's blowing all over. It's cold. It's December. <laughs> they drive down a little yellow Studebaker. They pull over to a place where you can pull out. They start climbing. Mother and he start climbing down the banks from the highway to the Hudson River. It's impossible. You're not supposed to do that. The police don't let you. They're climbing through brambles, through things. They're getting down the front. She's wearing a cape. He's wearing a dark blue coat with a belt in the back. They're carrying his father's ashes in a Maxwell House coffee can. And Howie, with tears in his eyes, very dramatic guy, he says, oh, he gets to the bank near the water. He's afraid of falling. He gets in and he says, oh, God bless you, Dad. Rest in peace. And he throws the ashes up in the air, and they all land back in his coat. <laughs> the wind blows them all back. And he keeps saying, good luck, and bless, and God, and God, and bless. Yeah. Couldn't get his father out of his coat. <laughs> so I said, I said, so Howie, what, what, what is your father's? What was your father's final resting place? He said, ran clean as on Columbus Avenue. <laughs> That's fine. The true story. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Whitelaw. Billy, where are you, Billy? I'm here. What did your mother think about blazing saddles, please? Yeah, well, that's ticklish. That's a ticklish question. Actually, my mother was very happy with it. When she saw the rough cut, she said, it's wonderful. Melvin, she said, Melvin. She always called me Melvin, M-E-L-B-M-N. <laughs> she named me M-E-L-V-I-N. Why should she call me L-B-M-N, Melvin? <laughs> she said, Melvin, <laughs> it should only make a million dollars. I said, Mom, if it does, we're finished. It costs two. <laughs> anyway, she was, she was tickled with it. Thank you for that question. Do we have a question? Is Martin Shaw in the house? Martin Shaw, folks. Yes. Martin Shaw. Yes, Martin. Do we have a question for you? What do you say to people who accuse you of bad taste? I say, up yours. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm usually very, I'm usually very polite. Yes. Thanks for that question. Yes, miss. I've heard that you're married to the most beautiful woman in the world. Is that true, Mr. Brooks? Uh, no, I'm married to Anne Bancroft. Ladies <laughs> <laughs> and gentlemen, my beautiful wife, my gorgeous wife, Anne Bancroft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. 
My wife is not saying any dirty words. <laughs> Dziękuję. She's saying Dziękuję, Dziękuję. Dziękuję means thank you in Polish. As a matter of fact, in the picture, we are two famous, radiant Polish theater stars. And we talk a little Polish, and we sing a little Polish. Why don't we sing <laughs> a little Polish for these? Yes, yes, yes. We're going to sing in Polish just the way we do in the movie. Oh, come on. Let me get up there. Come on, folk, let's encourage you. Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry, you can do it. I got cue cards, what are you worried about? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you'll remember it, you'll remember it. It's not so important, it's just a TV show. It doesn't have to be good, they're not paying for this. <laughs> Ten sama plan, będzie piłocę 